Hello, and welcome to the Drum History Podcast. I'm your host, Bart Vanderzee, and today I am very happy to have my old friend, Mr. Jay Petak, on the show. Jay, welcome. Oh, thanks, Bart. I'm happy to be here. Yes. And when I say old friend, I really, really mean old I'm friend old. because I'm old. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't mean like that. I mean, we have uh, known each other. I think it was 2011, I started interning at Sound Images, where you worked for a very, very long time mm-hmm. um, as a very prolific audio engineer, um, which we'll, we'll get into all this stuff. But let me just say up front, the topic we're talking about here today is going to be a little bit broad about the history of recording, but really we're going to try and hone in on the history of recording drums as much as we can. And we'll have a bunch of cool stuff along the way. So again, Jay, yeah. So like I said, we have known each other for, uh, <laughs> what is that now? Like 13 years or something like that. <laughs> so yeah, just tell people real quick. I mean, you, you worked on we have a shared experience that is kind of unique with the dialogue replacement recording that we yeah. at Sound Images did a lot of, which you did a ton of. Yeah, the, well, the last ADR session I did was with you, and it was yes, uh, that it was, was my with, first one with Colin Farrell for Fantastic Beasts and Where to Find yep. Them, and that was uh, uh, you know every everything we recorded ended up in the film. I, 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 yeah, it was. Um, Colin Farrell, you know, morphs later in the film. He morphs into uh, Johnny Depp, but but uh, all of his scenes, we did a line for that. So that, that's kind of cool. Yeah, that was that was my first. I haven't talked about it on the show in a while because Sound Images has ceased to exist, mm-hmm. and then it was Gwyn Sound where I worked, and you would still come in and do sessions, and now it's Play Audio Agency. But mm-hmm. uh, that was my first ADR session, and I went on to do about twenty of them after oh, wow. that. Over over, you know, there was like. But it's funny because you would record five minutes of like a session and it would be in like Arrested Development, the TV show mm-hmm. or something. It was it's a very unique uh, kind of subcategory of audio, audio engineering where you're looping lines, basically. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but- a good friend of mine uh, who actually I, I the first ADR he ever did, I did with him, uh, Greg Crawford. He's he's done over a thousand credits now. Uh, he's wow. out of a, a, a smart post Atlanta and uh, he's probably done more ADR than anybody in Hollywood, you know, because they have crews Jeez. and he's the, he's the main guy there. Yeah. But I can remember it was like, oh, uh, in the 1970s, it was a, uh, we were replacing the voice. It was a Japanese kind of puppet animation thing that we were doing in English. And uh, it was, it was kind of cool. <laughs> yeah, that is cool. I mean, but again, and we'll get into it here, but for me to come into the studio as an intern and spend time with you, who's who truly, I think you're one of the nicest people I've ever met. And then it was just such a nice thing. And then when I worked there, it was okay. Now, Hey, guess what? You're working in a movie with Colin Farrell and I assisted you. It was like, this is crazy. I mean, some of the most nerve wracking experiences I've ever had would be the night before you record stuff for a movie where I'm like freaking out, but then it was always fine. Yeah. It's always fine. I I spent a lot of time, you know, uh, trying to, pre-produce the thing so that yes. I, the, nothing could go wrong and something always went wrong but you know, <laughs> they, they got they were happy usually when they ended up so yes we had a great time but um all right before we start let me tell people if you watched the last one where now we're splitting episodes out every two weeks temporarily because i am up in my attic that is being renovated <laughs> i probably sound a little bit echoey echoeyer because there's not all this christmas piles of stuff up in here it's turning into a new studio which will be awesome uh, and I'm happy to say today is my birthday. And yes, happy birthday! I could not thank you, Jay, and I couldn't be happier to be here with you on my birthday. It's it's absolutely perfect. Um, so anyway, let's jump into this. Uh, Jay, you are an audio engineer, professor, but truly a historian of many many different audio and music related things. A Renaissance man across the board. But let's jump in here, Jay. The question up front is, let's talk about the earliest, you know, recordings of drumming, and maybe that inv- involves kind of the conversation of the earliest recordings, to, yeah. to preface that. Well, Edison, Edison, you know, kind of ripped off um, uh, Leon Scott de Martinville's uh, phone autograph that he, uh, uh, Leon Scott did that back uh, before the Civil War, but Edison basically copied that design and took credit for it and did the phonograph. But Edison was like, it was like those Justin Long, John Hodgman commercials where, yeah, I'm a Mac, I'm a PC. A- Edison was all business and Edison did not see music. And that wasn't even on his radar to do music. He was, he was going to do dict- you know, dictaphone type things. Hmm. And, um, it wasn't until 1889. Two guys, uh, Lewis Glass and William Arnold, took a uh, uh, took one of Edison's uh, disc players and played a disc kind of like this. This was a 
you know, like a, so a bake light or I don't know what, what they made them out of, but they're very fragile and, and made a, a jukebox. Um, they call it Nickelodeon and they put it in a hotel in San Francisco called the Palais Royale Saloon. And they left it in there for six months and, uh, you know, it cost a nickel and you could drop a nickel in and crank it up and you could hear a song and everybody, oh, that's cool. And, and they generated like a thousand bucks, which doesn't seem like a lot, but in, in 18 or in 1889, that was probably that's like, you know, you know, ton. some, some serious money. Uh, so people realized, oh, gee, you know, maybe, maybe recording music might be uh, something that we could do, <laughs> you know? Yeah. So, uh, uh, other people started doing that, um, uh, uh a uh, Mill Berliner who kind of invented the first microphone and he actually licensed it to Alexander Graham Bell for his telephone. He and, and a guy named Eldris Johnson started Victor, uh, 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 talking machine company and, and they made flat discs as opposed to cylinders. Edison was a cylinder guy. Edison said, well, you know, it's going to be better if we do a cylinder because the, the cylinder spins at the same rate uh, all the way through where a disc, you know, it, it, it's, it's, it's spinning at the same speed, but uh, toward the outside it's moving faster than on the inside. All that, that, that's kind of it's kind of a moot point because there were not much high frequency on the discs back then anyway. But well, let uh, me let me ask you yeah. before we move forward. Emil, what was his last name? Berliner. He he okay. was he was a German born but Ameri- he's an American citizen and he he started uh, Victor Talking Machine Company, which is like RCA Victor today or you know. Yes. And there was a I did an episode uh, two or three years ago. I did a short lived series that was like reading historical newspaper articles that were related to drums. And Emil Berliner, Berliner, Berliner did a, he had an early microphone that was inside of a toy drum mm-hmm. as the resonator. So drum related, you know, yeah. worth mentioning. <laughs> <laughs> to your point about, you know, how, how drummers were recorded, uh, you know, in the early days of recording, when somebody figured out, yeah, we can, people might actually pay to hear recorded music. What a concept. They, they would get everybody in a room, you know, uh, no overdubs. They, they, everybody would sit in a room and they would, you know, rehearse the song and then record it in one take. You know, uh, they, they mixed it by, by uh, like, okay, you're too loud. Move farther away. You're not loud enough. Move closer. Positioning. Yes. Yeah. Uh, you know, instead of moving faders, they were moving people around in the room and drums were yeah. always probably at the very, very, very back of the room, probably under, you know, under blankets and stuff. When they actually migrated to electrical recording, that was the Western uh, electric development in, in 1925. They, they figured out, okay, we can make discs, you know, with microphones, uh, but they, they, for the most part, they just replaced a single horn with a single microphone. So they did the same thing. They said, oh, you're too loud. Move farther away. You're not loud enough. Move closer. You know, yeah. uh, uh, interesting story. The the, um, the guitar pick uh, was kind of a, an invention of, um, I don't know, somebody probably had it before him, but Nick Lucas was the guy who's kind of credited with that. And he, you know, you know people used to play guitar with their fingers and, and it wasn't really loud enough to record. So he came out and he started playing with a pick. It's like, oh, yeah, we can hear it now. So, you know, all these things were you know, because of, of recording. What happened then, um, everything was 78, and actually 78 uh, were like, uh, it's 78.26. It's not actually 78, but it's, everybody just called it 78. The reason they, they, they arrived at that was that they could get a song, about a five-minute song on a cylinder, um, and that, that worked. And then they, they used that speed for, for discs. And, of course, these are, these are 70, 78s. I was going to show sure. show the group. This is why they call it an album because it, it, you, know, you can only get one song per side, you know. Yeah. So if you wanted a bunch of songs, you would bind them together in what looked like a photo album, yeah, like, like that. And and yeah. and so the term is still around today. Somebody makes a CD and they call it an album, but that's that's why. I think people have seen those. You see those at like I don't want to yeah. say like a garage sale yeah. or your grandma's house or something, <laughs> yeah, something like that. That's, I got it at my mom's house. Yes, that's where I got it too. So you know what's interesting to think about is like because we're going to get into like in the future, like people think of like the Beatles recording on like a four track. Yes. At this point, we're really recording on like a one track mm-hmm. because it's Absolutely. going in the horn and it's it's the needle basically. There was making the, the master. Yeah. No. Right? No. No editing. No mixing. Uh, Basically, the engineer listened at the at the horn or at the microphone and, and said, "Well, you know, electrical recording they could be in a control room then, but but in the old days they would listen right at the micro at the horn, and they say, okay, it's good. Everybody, everybody ready? They would they would uh, drop the needle, cue the band. When the band finishes, it would spiral once or twice. He would lift the needle off, and that was the record. That was it. Uh, they couldn't even play the record back because uh, a steel needle would would." you know, etch the, the material. Prior to 1934, it was just aluminum. It was like a bare aluminum disc. After 1934, they started coating them with acetate, hmm. which is the, the kind of way they do it now. Uh, Bucky Herzog, who I used to work for uh, years ago, was telling me that 
if there was a question like, did I sing the wrong word in the second verse or did I come in early on the, you know, on the bridge or whatever, they could take like a cactus needle, which was very, it was very low res playback, but it, it was non abrasive. And so they could, they could kind of hear, oh yeah, I, I think I sang the right word. So, so that was good. And that wouldn't destroy the disc. Wow. Would they then be able to re-record over things, or would they just have to toss the disc and start over? Oh yeah, once the disc was, it's it's a, it's, it's like a CD. What you know, once the once the grooves are etched in it, it's it's toast. You know. Got it. Got it. Now, is there information that we know? I mean, if we're thinking early late eighteen hundreds, early nineteen hundreds with drummers, I mean, it was probably someone just kind of on a snare drum. Yeah. I mean, I'm trying to think of when double drumming with the, the, the having one guy having a bass drum and a snare, it was probably pretty minimal as far as drummers. Yeah. I, I'm not sure. I'm not, you know, that I, I can't be sure of whether they actually had a, uh, you know, like a full Sousa marching band in there with, 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 yeah, yeah. uh, with, you know, a whole drum rank and everything. But, um, uh, you know, drums were drums were always a problem because they they were they were loud. You know, uh, Tom Dowd was one of the proponents of of, uh, of multiple mics and close miking. Uh, he kind of he and Les Paul kind of went against the grain of everybody else that were like, you know, let's just get everybody in the room, put up one mic, and find the sweet spot, and that's where you stick the mic, and 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 everything's good. You know, he he said, you know. There's no way that that a, a, an acoustic bass is going to be louder than a drummer. There's no way that that's uh, you know acoustic bass is going to be louder than a trumpet. You know, so um, he he thought you know if you could use several mics. Um, and, and by the way, Tom Dowd is kind of the father of the modern recording console too, because prior to him, uh, recording consoles just had like the big knobs. You know, they didn't have faders, sliding faders. And he was the one who said, let's let's put sliding faders on this so you can actually play with your with all ten fingers as opposed yeah. to just two hands. Yeah. The knobs are cool looking. Oh, I, yeah. I love, I love seeing the knobs. They're really cool. And it kind of looks like uh, old, school. It's, it's yeah. old school. It's a sign of the times, but all right. So then where do we go from there? So we went from the cylinders to now, like, you know, the album, the record albums with the one needle yeah. burning it in and yeah. the horn. Yeah. Uh, so, so in 1925, they started recording electrically. And, and I, I like I said, Initially, most of the people still did it exactly the way they did it prior to that, except they were just replaced the horn with a microphone. Uh, and so those were, you know, all 78s, one, one song per side. Um, it wasn't uh, until uh, a year later, 1926, when Western Electric developed a sound for film. They called it Vitaphone. And uh, they, they decided since we don't have to make it backward compatible, we can do a 33 and a third now uh, disc. Uh, and it had to be that because it had to fit like an entire reel of film on one disc, you know, inside yeah. of one disc. And that was that first Vitaphone film. I've talked about this on the show before, but that, uh, people think jazz singer a lot. 1927 Don, but it was Juan. Don Juan. Yeah. The yes. year earlier jazz singer was in 27 and then lights of New York was in 28. And yeah. um, that was a full talkie that had that dialogue. Talk but 26 was Don Juan with sound for picture yes. for music. Cause that's like kind of the, it doesn't get the credit that maybe it mm -hmm. I've deserves. seen both. I've seen those pictures now, you know, and, and uh, they, they, they're online and you can, you can actually view them. And uh, you know, Don Juan's kind of like a music video where, uh, and, and so is, uh, so is a uh, uh, jazz singer. Um, yeah. That, that was Vitaphone. And of course, then they, they went after that, they started going into single system things like uh, Photophone, which was Alexander Graham Bell. You know, Alexander Graham Bell invented the first wireless phone too. And that was that with a, that's the system they used for Photophone. And, mm. and they still, they still kind of use it. Uh, although, well, they don't really, cause they don't, they don't project on film anymore. I don't think any theaters using film. They're all doing digital projection. All digital. Yeah. 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 Um, but anyway, when they started moving to tape, tape was actually invented um, the, the concept of tape was goes back to the 1800s. A guy named Valdemar Polson, who was a Danish physicist, and he had he had magnetic tape recorders, but it was kind of like a bandsaw without any teeth, you know. And uh, it moved really quickly, like 60 IPS, and if it broke, it would swirl around the room and decapitate everybody. I, I've heard that. <laughs> yeah, maybe that. I think that goes around school. Like I remember being in school, and people were like. Yeah, I got de decapitated, or it's like that story that just lives on forever. <laughs> the Blattner phone and all these things, but but uh, <laughs> uh, there was a guy named uh, Fritz Floimer who was a, an Austrian who developed the first magnetic tape recorder back in 1928, and 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 it was commercially produced. Uh, AEG, which was a German company, kind of like RGE, the Consumer Electronics, whatever. They 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 licensed it. He licensed it to them, and and so it was all over Germany. And uh, for some reason, the United States didn't know about it. You know, it was like a, it wasn't like. I know we were about to go to war with Germany, but but it wasn't like, you know, at, at the time that happened, we weren't at war with Germany, but nobody mm -hmm. knew about it. And so sure. uh, a guy named Jack Mullen uh, 
brought a tape recorder back to the United States after World War II. He was a signal operator. And he kind of appropri- he went into a radio station and just stole two machines from him. So I'm taking these back with me. And uh, he kind of modified them, uh, kind of changed the speed and changed a few things on them, but, but made it like the Ampex 200. And his idea was wow. to use it in movies. Uh, you know, for movie dialogue, because they were they were recording movie dialogue with with basically uh, optical film recorders at that time. Huh. And um, but Bing Crosby's producer said, "Oh no, this is this would be good for us because we have to do a radio show at at nine o'clock, and then we have to do it again at eleven for the West Coast." You know, so so if, if they thought, "Gee, if we can just pre-record it, it'd be great." You know, so that's what they did. So a much more, and I've heard that again. I'm going back to rem- I remember hearing that in school, but so it was again to like restate that a soldier. Mm-hmm. For all for without all the details, soldier was in Germany. Took two tape machines that they were using in Germany from a radio station over yeah. there because they had the technology. Brings it back. That's a higher quality way to record. Yeah. How many tracks would they be able to record then? One per. It's it's, my, it's full track full track mono machine. Okay, so so each so then they had they had two of them. So I guess he could do one and one, right? Um, he um. I, I don't know he, uh, if, uh, or they just did one. I, he, one. he was he was developing one machine, and I, I'm not sure if he was cannibalizing parts. You know, of parts, one. I'm, okay. I'm not sure. That he also came back with the the big issue with the the one in Germany was that actually not so much the machine, but it was the tape. You know, instead of using this metal wire, or metal you know uh, ribbon, but uh, they were using. Um, Fritz Floymer had a, a business where he put uh, like uh, metallic stripes on cigarettes, so he knew how to coat. Uh, uh, paper with with uh, oxide metal yeah, yeah metal yeah, yeah. and so so uh, the first tape was uh, it was like uh, IG Farben you know paper tape and uh, so that's what they were using and it was I don't think it was until probably the mid fifties or or uh, uh, early sixties that they started actually making them out of plastic you know uh, it was the way tape is today either acetate or some uh, you know polyester type. Um, Gotcha. But now how does that relate to, okay, so moving forward, then they have that technology. Again, it's usually brought in for like movies mm-hmm. or radio, Bing Crosby's involved, who Bing Crosby was a pretty talented, yeah. he could he could hit the skins and, uh, <laughs> yeah. you know, like the film, I think it's Easter Parade, where he does like a whole thing going through a shop playing drums. But um how does that relate to well, recording drums and well, bands? Les Paul, Les Paul worked for Bing Crosby. So Bing Crosby okay. became became a distributor for Ampex and gave Les Paul his first his first actual tape machine that that he that he used. And and uh, Les Paul modified it, put an extra head on there so he could do sound on sound uh, internally. And he yep. he recorded uh, most of the stuff he recorded though he recorded at home and uh, and the drums were him doing drum licks on the guitar. Yeah, um, but when when uh, they first started be using uh, first started using tape for bands. Um, they were, you know, uh, again, I, I'm, I'm sure there a lot of stuff was recorded in one take. But when they got two track machines, they started splitting it out. The first time I was ever in a recording studio was probably 1965. I was, you know, in high school and we made a record, you know. And uh, the way they did it, they had it was kind of like a Les Paul technique, but they didn't have multi track. They had two two track machines, and so we recorded uh, the first track to one machine, then they would play that back, and, and we'd overdub as they bounced into the second machine, they record, it's kind of weird. They, they put the bass and the, and the kick drum on one track, everything else on the other, they weren't considered, you know, weren't considered by stereo, but they, they would keep those, those, uh, that track configuration. And then uh, huh. if you were adding more guitars and more keys and more, whatever, uh, that would all get mixed together with it, with everything else with the drums and, and the, the previously recorded keys and, and whatever. If you started doing vocals, then they would take those two tracks and mix that together in mono and then uh, do the vocals on the other track. And, and so, um, got it. Uh, that's kind so of, it's just layering and layering yeah. and layering, but you're basically not able to, you can't really undo your first no, layer that no, you did. And it's, <laughs> it's kind of, what do they call it? Like ping pong recording. Ping-ponging. Where you're bouncing. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, you're going, yeah, and, and it was a little bit easy, a little bit safer than Les Paul. When Les Paul did it, he did it on one, one machine, and literally when he hit the record button, he was erasing everything he had done. But uh, he was picking it up upstream and, and, and mixing it. But if he if he had screwed up after twenty takes, you know, twenty layers, he had to start all over again. Uh, we yeah. we had the advantage of well, okay, I messed it up. They could back the tape up, and we could we could you know do another because the the tape we yeah. just recorded had, was not being erased; it was being played back. Now, well, what, and and I think I want to mention that I don't think it's it's something to really get into heavily today, but. I think if people are listening and they're interested in this, going down the rabbit hole about Les Paul and like how high the moon and like these mm-hmm. his his involvement in the history of recording is really a fun thing to look into. So I will just let people know that you should really check out Les Paul as far as his techniques. Yeah, he's, a, he's that's a, really 
Yeah. He's the father of multi-track. I mean, any, any app, any, uh, you know, uh, you know, here's, here's a quick story about Les Paul. He, uh, he came up with the idea of, of how to do a, a multi-track machine that you could, uh, you could actually overdub on. They had, they had multi-track machines that, that you couldn't overdub on as early as 1951, but he uh, approached several different, uh, tape recorder companies. Nobody was interested in it. They thought it was like, nobody wants to overdub except Les Paul. So we don't, you know, we don't really care. Les Paul yeah. paid Ampex fifty thousand dollars. He told them exactly how to do it. They built it for him, and uh, he didn't get any royalties. I mean, as soon as he got the machine, everybody said, "Oh yeah, that's pretty cool. I want one too." And Ampex <laughs> sold like a b- bazillion of these. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and uh, Les Paul got nothing from it. So uh, he's he's terribly overlooked. I mean, he's done more for sound, I think, than just about anybody other than Edison and whatever. But anyway, yeah. when when we started getting into multi track now, uh, like where we could overdub. Like on four track, basically they, they still pretty much recorded that same way. Uh, uh, they they put like the kick and the bass on one track, uh, everybody else on the other track, and then, then the other two tracks were overdub vocals and other stuff. Uh, it wasn't until they got to like eight track where they said, okay, now we got enough tracks, we can put the drums by themselves. Maybe I've seen some eight track track sheets where they they still have the drum and, and, and bass drum together, or they kick drum and, and bass together, and then the, the drums on their own. But most of the time, the, you, know, you had drums, bass, guitar, you know, so you had enough stuff to, to do that. When you got to 16 track, the two inch 16 track, then uh, drums usually got split out into uh, uh, bass, snare, and overhead, you know, like they, they ca- call it kit, but it was like Tom cymbals, you know, just single yeah. overhead mic or single overhead track. Maybe they had multiple mics, but it was all mixed to one track. When they went yeah. to 24 track, then uh, it was generally like bass, uh, bass drum, snare drum, stere- either stereo overhead or bass drum, snare drum, uh, toms and cymbals. You know yeah. how you want to split out, and of course, if you had, you know, if you weren't going to put a lot of other stuff on the on the, you know, the recording, you could sp- have the drums on like oh, spread over eight tracks. You could have a track for the hat and track stereo yeah, tracks yeah, yeah. for, but you know, it just depended on, on what you know what you were going to be doing later on um, to do that. Yeah, well, I mean, that's that's the good qu- the the great question here that you just um, you kind of alluded to it, but really, so if you have a four track and you want to have. Uh, your drums be one of the tracks. I know you would probably combine them with a four track, but you would just mainly have like, would you use multiple mics and then sum them down to one sure. track? Generally, yes. Uh, they have, they, have, they, they it was done in studios. So they, they had, they had mixers, and uh, you know, I was always, I was always so impressed with the mixers back then because they, they were often mixing stuff that they, they. They couldn't hear. You know, they would ask, "Okay, what are you going to be adding to this?" And, and we tell them at the beginning of the session, "Oh, we're going to maybe have some some brass come in." And and so that that was in their mind when they were mixing it, and they would mix it slightly differently depending on what they knew was coming up, even though they couldn't hear it. You know, because it wasn't it hadn't been added yet. Yeah, yeah, really. Though, okay, so I get it though. So you have your let's say three drum mics or whatever mm-hmm. into a mixer, and then the output of the mixer right. would be into one of your tracks, Correct. which then could be ping pong bounced down on top, yeah. and the, and then you have the generational loss yes yes that's that's somebody people you know uh today don't even think about because digital you can you know keep making clones and copies but every time you you re-recorded something it was worse <laughs> you know it was like 3db yeah. well, worse than noise and and you had uh any any issue with the tape uh and in the recording you had it, it actually made it worse so you know les paul to his credit you know I, he did a he was using full track tape and, and, and one machine, I guess maybe because it was all internal and didn't have to run cables all over the, the house there. Uh, his stuff sounded pretty good even after you know, that many overdubs, but normally, yeah. normally, you know, if you overdub it like, you know, eight, eight or 10 times, you can hear, you know, all kinds of tape. Well, noise. it's the, it's the, like, I think you, maybe you or a teacher said something to me about it. it's the, it's the making, you know, you take a piece of paper and you make a copy of a copy of a copy of right. a copy. It gets less yes. clear each time Absolutely. and that's what happens there. But yeah, you, nowadays you don't, we don't know the, uh, um, you know, the, the world of, of that. But, and one thing you mentioned too, with the, the drum mics is it's been, uh, mentioned in previous episodes, but I know, I think John Bonham, I don't want to open the can of worms about John Bonham's recording because there's a lot of passionate people, but I believe there was a overhead. It'd be like a single overhead that was getting the snare and and it would be like a shotgun mic above them to get the snare. It was just a really interesting yeah. setup and different technique back then for well, drum mics. I, I had read some years ago uh, in one of the trade mags, uh, like three Grammy winning engineers. So they're all good. One of them said, you know, I only use uh, three mics. I have a, a, a mic on the kick, a mic on the snare and a mic overhead because I don't want to have 
uh, resonances, fa- out of phase mics. Another guy who also won Grammy said, Oh, I, I use uh, two mics on the snare and a mic for every, every time and a mic, you know, so he, he wants just the opposite. And, and both approaches can work if you know what you're doing, really. Um, yeah. you know, what, one of the issues we, we had, uh, recording drums, especially when we were, you know, uh, uh, trying to get a good, you know, tight drum sounds. Uh, often when you, when you do extra mics, I have mics on the tom so that they're in doom, doom, all those tom licks sound great. Uh, yep. you're hearing, you're hearing like, uh, resonances and bleed from the kick and snare, you know, in, in the toms. And sure. one thing we used to do, uh, not, not that often, but sometimes we would go into and, you know, on the, on the tom tracks and we would, uh, take a grease pencil. Okay. Here's where the lick ends. Here's where it starts again. We would defeat the bias on the record head. We would defeat the pinch roller and we would kind of wind it by hand to kind of spot a race in between. So silence, you know, once you had automation, you could just kind of mute it in those places. Yeah. But before automation, uh, you, you had to, you know, go to stupid things like that. Uh, uh, well that's, but that's a, that's a level of, cause my experience with tape would be with at sound images mm-hmm. was doing tape transfers mm-hmm for people. And it was like, just even that little bit of like, I mean, even when I started, I would be doing like interviews where I would be connecting people and it would be like, like, um, ISDN calls. And I would be running down the hall (laughs) to the machine room to like, turn off the phone because you get this horrible loud. "Eh, eh, eh." So I'd be running down to turn it off every it gets easier and easier and easier every decade. And that was in 2012. Yeah. So, um, well, the other, th- the other thing that made drums, uh, more manageable, um, were gates, you know, we, we, we got gates on the toms and toms are great, uh, things to gate because they're, re- they're either really loud or they're kind of off, you know, they, they don't, yeah. they don't sustain that long usually. And, uh, so we would put gates on the toms. So those mics were basically shut down unless the, you know, the player hit them and then boom, they would come on. You know, yeah. by the way, a story about gates, you know, the one reason why astronauts would go like, uh, Houston, we have a problem. So their mics were gated and they would do the, uh, to turn the, wake the mic up. You know? so, really? Yeah. That's the story I heard. I, I think it's true, but, uh, well that, but it became like a, uh, like a trope of like, uh, <laughs> yeah. Houston, we've got a problem or <laughs> yeah. and I wonder, and it even seems like pilots do that too. I wonder well, if that's it, it might, it might have, it might be the same issue. Yeah. They might have yeah. to wake, wake up the thing. So I think we're at the point talking about we're getting into the multi we're adding adding um tracks for mm-hmm. recording. We kind of know now we're getting more what before I ask the next question, what year, what decade are we in right now that we're talking about with having eight tracks? Let's say that. Well, like when, when okay, eight tracks um uh, seventies, uh, nineteen seventies. Eight tracks were were kind of big. That was Les Paul's original machine. Okay, eight, in so, nineteen, he got the Ampex eight track in nineteen fifty six. But it didn't arrive the rest of the world for a few years. I mean, Tom Dowd got the second one, and and then everybody else said, "Oh, that's pretty cool." And they they got him after that. Sixteen track, uh, was uh, you know, late late seventies, eighties, twenty four track. Okay. Uh, uh, there are still studios using tape. You know. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, that that they believe in tape. Uh, tape even was stopped. Uh, being made for a while, but there's still studios now that, that, that love tape. Um, four track would have been sixties. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And in fact, and the Beatles, like Be- Beatles, the Beatles four yeah. track was actually a one inch four track. It was not a half inch. And that's why it sounded so good. Uh, it was, uh, it was like really, you know, the thicker, the, the wider the tracks, the better the signal of the noise. So it, it was, cause uh, the more headroom you have. Yes. Right. Yes. Okay. He- headroom and just uh, the, the more signal you could put on the tape. So you were talking about gates and while we're in this kind of like 50s, 60s, 70s, like let's go to whenever 50s, 60s, uh, when did they start applying like, let's say on the drums, like using a reverb on a snare? Like what was, when did effects on recordings come into drums and beyond? Well, here's the, here's the thing back then. Uh, and, and I've, you know, I've kind of remixed the, the Beatles tracks too. You know, you can download those, those from the internet. Uh, you had to kind of record that way. You had to make that commitment. Okay. I want, I want, it's not like an afterthought, like we're in the final mix. Now I'm going to add reverb to the snare. It was like, okay, we're recording now. I think if the snare would sound really cool with reverb, you know? Uh, it's like, and I, then it's printed. Yeah. I don't know if you're thinking like the bridge over troubled waters where they had the elevator shaft, you know, reverb on, on, on that, on, on the drums. Sure. Um, but yeah, it, it, that's the way it was with the Beatles too. Uh, all, most of the reverb you, in fact, all the reverb that you hear on their records, that was actually on the, the multi-track stems. Uh, they did no, no program limiting. Uh, it was like, uh, there was a lot of limiting going on, but it was all 
on each one of the stems because I, I can take the four tracks and I can mix it. It sounds just like the record. I mean, it's not like there's no mastering guy involved. It's just like, well, that's what it sounded like. And they just made it that way. Um, and it would be, an inc- but it's like incredible tube, like outboard gear. That's like now worth thousands and thousands and yeah. thousands of dollars. I'm sure. Well, like- here's, here's a reverb story. Uh, the, the studio where I first recorded years ago was a converted house, but, but it was a nice studio. They had really nice console and everything. They used the, the garage in the back as a echo chamber. They didn't have, you know, the digital echoes weren't around. I mean, you know, the, there were, there were probably plate reverbs and spring reverbs, but they had this, this garage that they had kind of sealed up and put it like a Neumann mic and a speaker. And that was their, their echo chamber. When we recorded in the daytime, usually no problem at night, somebody, and they're recording with the reverb and somebody said, wait a minute, I'm hearing crickets. <laughs> they would have to go out with, with a raid and search and destroy <laughs> and, and kill all the crickets, you know, you uh, in, in you the reverb. Do. Yeah. The other thing, um, that I noticed about, about the, um, the drums is, is how the sound of, of the, you know, the, the sound of the drums makes such a big, uh, impact on everything else. You know, it's, it's like strength up the middle. You know, I, we had this kit. Let me tell you about this kit. A friend of mine sold me a kit for the studio. This was back before sound images, I, my previous gig at Audiocraft. And, um, it had a 34 inch bass drum, 34 inch bass drum. The floor wow. toms were 26 and 28 floor toms. The rack toms were, I think, I don't know, 22, 24. It was just, it was like a made for Godzilla. It was a Ludwig kit, but it was made for Godzilla. Okay. Yeah. And, that's like clown size. Yeah. <laughs> and so, you know, we tried everything to get it to sound good. You know, we, we, we tried different heads and taking bottom heads off, bottom heads on, and it never really sounded very good. So finally we gave, we said, okay, this is, we're not, we're not going to do this anymore. We got, you know, a normal human size kit from, and uh, the the players came in. We had the same players come in to do, you know, the A-list players every every week to do jingles, uh, usually two or three times a week, you know, guitar, yeah. bass, piano, bass, guitar, drums. And we did a take and so we got one when they came in to listen to it. And and um, everybody came up to me one at a time, like the guitar player said, what'd you do to the sound of my guitar? It sounds really good. The bass player said, did you change something on the bass? The bass has never sounded that good before. The, the piano player said, you got a new piano tuner? I mean, the piano just really pops and none of that happened. And we just got a new set of drums and everything in context sounded much better. Yeah. I mean, you, you say you're not a drummer, but you know a ton about this, but I mean, from your experience in engineering, I mean, do you think that's the kit? Do you think it's the player? Do you well, think it, it's the mics? Is it, it a mix of everything? It's both, but but th- that situation, um, we had the same mics. I mean, of course, they were closer because we didn't we could get closer because the kit wasn't so big. <laughs> yeah. But I had another I had another um, situation where uh, the, again we have the new kit now, the smaller kit, and I, I've got uh, I you know I'm I'm not still not getting the drum sound I really want. There's another producer in town that I really like his his the drum sound just really pops on his stuff. So I, I, I hired his drummer for a session and uh, we didn't change anything, you know, the same kit, same mic, same position. And suddenly there's the sound. It's like, you know, so the way you play the drums out, you know, you, cause you're a drummer and you know, that the way you play the drums makes a, sure. a big deal, you know? Yeah. 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 Well, that's the, without going down that rabbit hole too, but like people would be chasing Tony Williams drum sound, but then the, his ride, but then people realized, Oh, it's him. It's him. Is, is the big thing. But so while we're in this kind of era of like, you know, f- I think the history of it, it really early, it's kind of like, like when I think of history of recording drums, it seems like 50s to 70s and 80s. It's really like evolving a lot. And after that, it kind of, you know, 90s things change, but it it's it's more uh, standardized after that. But the question is, and I'm looking at your list of really good topics you sent me, but um, drum booths, mm-hmm. drum alcoves, center of the room. Yeah, let's talk about the history sure. and evolution of how where they were re- recorded. Yeah, well, that was uh, again that that goes back to Tom Dowd. He was one of the first people to to actually think of a, using a drum booth or a drum alcove to kind of isolate the drums a little bit better. Um, at the studio, uh, off we, we did have a drum booth, and uh, what we did often though is put the We'd put the guitar amp in the drum booth and we'd, we'd uh, cover up the piano with a real heavy packing blanket. We'd put like PCM mics on the underside of the piano lid, cover the piano and, and the drums could be like literally next to the piano and we weren't getting much bleed either way hmm. with that. Um, but the, the booth, whenever we did like a, a big, a big band session where we had, you know, trumpets and trombones and, 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 saxes and, and everything, we would put the drums in the booth because otherwise the drums would get in every mic if yeah. they were out in the room. Then there's also like the uh, gobo and like mm-hmm. the kind of, you know, walls on yeah, wheels yeah. and there's the techniques of putting 
um, blankets over the bass drum with the microphone. Yeah. I mean, I, you know, is there any info that you, you have on kind of when that sort of even went further? I mean, I guess gobos and things were around since oh, yeah. forever. Yeah. Just for, yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, you know, Ringo, uh, Ringo sound of the Beatles, you know, that had that real dead sound where it, everybody's trying to figure out they, they, it was a really cool sound. And, and I'm sure there were, there were blankets or towels like on, on, it's on the his tea towels. Yeah. 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 And, and, um, we had uh, gobos, as you know, at the studio. They were, they were, they were you know, kind of thick. Uh, uh, we we were considering getting those, you know, plexiglass type gobos that I've seen. You know, uh, people use them live, and you know that that's that's kind of cool too. Another thing yeah, yeah. that people did back in the seventies, I, I had on my list here the the drum umbrellas. Have you ever seen those? Uh, no, I was just looking. I was about to. I was about to. Go, what the hell is a drum <laughs> yeah, umbrella? Yeah, <laughs> it was it was kind of a it was kind of a big deal in the seventies. A lot of studios were going that. It was literally an umbrella over the top of the drums. I, I sent a picture for it to you, but yep. but it, the idea was that. I don't know if it did two things. It, it it maybe reflected back some of the some of the sound, or um, it, it helped contain the you know the drum sound from getting out. But uh, some some studios literally had like a big beach umbrella over the over the drums, um, you know. And I don't know how what they would do about the stick, you know, <laughs> going down your well, back or whatever. But it's kind of like in studios. There's and that's Kenny Aronoff in the picture you sent. But like. Um it's kind of like how the, in rooms there's like a cloud above yeah, you, yeah, you know, with yeah. like, like it makes a lot of sense. It looks kind of, um, a little silly. It's a little <laughs> like a little crazy. Let's but have honestly, a picnic. In the, yes. In the studio, I don't think anything kind of, I don't think anything's off limits. Mm -hmm. I think it's like, I remember miking up a drum set and we took a, or, or I forget it might've been guitars, but it was with Adam Plyman and yeah. it was, taking a trash can and putting a 57 in the back of the trash can and getting <laughs> that and blending it in. But that was like, that was like 15 drum mics and that was like number 16. Well, that's, so that's an, yeah. Yeah. I was going to say, that's one of the nice things about, uh, you know, the digital workstations with lots of inputs. You can, you can try all kinds of things and they don't work. Just don't use them. You know, you're not committing, yeah. you're not committing to them. But in the old days, they were basically, they had to commit <laughs> to those, yeah. to those things. You know, the other thing, uh, with, with drums too, and, and, uh, uh, this was an issue with tape. I'm going to tell the students that we always put like uh, either the bass or the kick drum on, on, on the outside tracks. And that was because uh, as the tape, you know, is going uh, over the heads and onto a reel, sometimes the edges of the, the flanges of the reel actually creased or, or, you know, kind of warped a little bit the tape and the low frequency stuff like the kick drum and the bass didn't, weren't affected by that because they're printed so deeply into the tape. But if you put cymbals on one of those outside tracks, it sounds like flanging, you know, you'd be, you know, yeah. Um, I mean, it's a level of, of thinking about stuff that we don't have to do nowadays. <laughs> I mean, really yeah. it's, it's interesting to think about that, that it just doesn't, uh, it just doesn't come up anymore, but, um, all right. So let's just keep going on the history of drive. So many more questions. Yeah. Let's just keep going on the history of drum recording. I think we were at sixties and seventies. So yeah, well, seventies, I, I was going to mention seventies, you know, the the signature sound of the seventies is probably the disco stuff with the the uh, uh, snare uh, syndromes and the rototoms, you know. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you, Electronics. You hear yeah. that? You hear that? And you say, "Oh yeah, that's 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 uh, that's disco," you know. Nineties, uh, yep. uh, uh, you know, eighties had their sound too, but nineties uh, the thing was the gated reverb. I don't know if you're, yep. you know. Oh yeah. And and uh, we've had track. There was a really cool sound. Everybody liked it, but now it, it's so dated that, uh, like. You know, even 10 years after that, we had some tracks that we were thinking of repurposing, you know, like, oh, I'll just sell this to somebody else. And somebody heard it and say, ah, I don't know, those drums are, <laughs> those drums are too, too 90s, you know, to use. But it'll become cool again. Yeah. Like now in the, in 2024, probably next year, it's like, everyone's like, God, I love that gated Tom. Sound. Well, you know, I, we, I, recording engineers have said that about auto tune, that auto tune is going to date those recordings. Auto tune has been around for 30 years and people are still using it, you know? Yeah. You know, it was, yeah, it yeah, was yeah. invented at Exxon, believe it or not. I don't know if you knew that. Like Exxon, the oil company, Mobile? Exxon, wow. that company. It was it was a guy named Andy Hildebrand, and he was using this this program to kind of uh, do seismic research. And he he said, "Well, I can repurpose this for audio." So he, I think he left and, and did AutoTune, but but that's how it started. <laughs> wow. So, and then another thing, kind of going off of this on your list is live versus dead drum yeah, rooms, yeah. which is a big topic. I mean, that's that's. Tiny. I remember it at, even at Sound Images, we would record in the far room, in the live room sometimes with drums, super dead. But then other times it'd be in the main big room, a bigger sound. Yeah. I mean, 
Talk about that. Well, you know, uh, I'm I'm kind of a fan of dead because you can always add reverb, you know. But uh, like I, I visited um, the Bamboo Room, which was uh, 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 Musper's studio. Uh, 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 the guy who he's now in Ecuador, but he was yeah he was Irwin. Irwin. Yeah, he he recorded uh, um, a, you know a, a ton of hit records like Def Leppard. And yeah, stuff yeah, and and and, yeah. and he, one of his rooms. It was a it was a fairly small room, but it was for the drums, and it was like you know you clap your hands like it, it sounded like it was a concert hall. Um, so some people like that. Um, I, I, I again, I'm a fan of like well, you know you can always you can always add reverb if you want, uh, uh, yeah. but you can't take it away as easily. But uh, yeah. It, yeah, it might make the player feel you know feel better about playing. But maybe I there was an episode of uh, uh, where. Um, the Foo Fighters were in some studio, and I don't know if it was in Chicago somewhere. And and the the guy said, "Yeah, I, I located here because this room had great echo, and the, the drum was going, whoa, listen to that." <laughs> yeah, I mean, but I'm I'm um maybe it's my engineer background, but I'm sort of more on board with everything you're saying. Where like as a drummer, I'm like, yeah, this is awesome. But then I'm like, as an engineer, you're like, that's kind of hard to control. <laughs> yeah. So I'm sure it's it's preferences for people, but um. So okay, now I have a question for yeah. you. And let's 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 do this as maybe a quick game, <laughs> oh, okay? Because I'll probably lose. I see, no, I think you'll you can't lose. It's physically impossible to lose. Okay, so you wrote how drum sounds can date a recording in a couple words: sixties, seventies, eighties, nineties, and on. So if I say, like, let's say you have to under five words describe the drum sound, not limited to five. Okay, just v- okay. really, really, okay. really quick. Just okay. how do you describe it? 50s how do you describe the drums uh, kind of distant you know uh, they, they weren't as present because uh, uh they you know i mean it's still great that uh you know i listen to some of these old recordings and think wow you know that was probably done as a mono recording and it still holds up really well but yes. it doesn't have the presence yeah 60s how do you describe the uh, a tight a, a tighter sound you know i think of the uh, the, the beatles specifically the tum tum you know where the drums yep. don't really ring very much mike's got closer yeah Yep. Okay. Seventies. How do you? I mean, <laughs> disco. Yes. I mean, there, there, there was other music, obviously, in the seventies, except besides disco. But, but that's yep. kind of that's kind of what, what I feel. Eighties. When you get to eighties, I'm I'm thinking, uh, just bigger, bigger sound. You know, it's more theatrical and and big toms. Yeah. Yep. Yep. And, uh, and I saw a lot of them in, in in these episodes I've done, and we'll do the nineties too. But in the in the eighties and nineties, they started using under tom. Like Sennheiser 421 yeah. is like sticking up in these like like power huge power toms, um, which again that would be like Alex Van Halen or something where there's a lot of mics to spare. But how do you describe the 90s? Well, sound? again, that we talked about earlier, the, the gated gated reverb was really popular. That that half second uh, uh, quick you know delay on yeah. uh, on the on the snare was was kind of the the signature thing. You know, think of the, like the Kenny Loggins stuff and and. Uh, Danger Zone, all that stuff was yep. was like that 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 sound on the drums. Um, but '90s kind of sort of like halfway through. I feel like it was that grunge came in and oh, switched yeah. in. And but then you even get like you think of like the Spin Doctors or something, where it became more of like a just very present. Na- I want to say natural sound, yeah. but well, you know, you know, grunge kind of that whole grunge thing kind of saved guitars too, because uh, you know in the '80s uh, there were it was more you know synth driven bands there there are some bands that the guitar was like almost not there you know and then and then uh uh, when grunge came about and you know that that kind of rock and roll uh groups like creed you know that was my son's favorite group at one time you know and and, they're uh, huge again yeah and (laughs) and, huge now yeah and so that 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 made the guitar popular again yeah it did um well then this so the next one getting into though is like 2000s 2010s which gets into you you have a point here about drum recording in home studios yeah. well everything changed yeah everything changed well you know uh, billy eilish recorded all her hit records in her bedroom <laughs> you know that's why that's why all the big studios are closing because people say yeah i've got this laptop and i can just use that um yeah. i i was i was uh you know i tell my students that you know if, if you don't want to buy like an eight channel interface to record the drums or anything, you can, you can do, um, you know, a zoom H4N. It has, I have my H4N yeah, too. I love it. I've got, I got a, I got a bunch of these and you, you've got, uh, you know, two, two external mics, two internal mics. You can put this for the, you can record four channels once. So do this for the overhead, yep. then kick, kick and snare, you know, and, yep. and you've got, uh, you know, 
there's your drums. Now, the disadvantage of doing this versus, you know, recording it, everything at once on, on, on a DAW is that in order to hear playback, you have to kind of put it all together. <laughs> you know, it's not like you yeah. can do an immediate playback, but if everybody felt good about the track, you know, yeah, let's, let's, let's put that one together and see what it sounds like. Well, I mean, at the end of the day, you could record in a million dollar studio. You could record on an H four N what you're recording is the most important thing. And it would sound if you're an amazing, you know, world-class drummer, you probably would record a little better than a beginner drummer. The quality of the playing matters a lot, yeah. but, um, yeah. Okay. So, so that's, that's good. And that takes us up to today, basically. I mean, what do you see happening now and in the future of recording? I mean, you're, you're, you're a professor, you're teaching in electronic media class, basically. Or, I yeah. mean, do they even call it electronic uh, media they, anymore? Not in, they changed it to uh, applied media communications. It used to be um, uh, electronic uh, electronic media, and they thought the name electronic media sounded a bit dated. Um, but that's what I went to school with. I mean, it's <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but I guess it is. So so anyway, what do you see happening in the future for for let's say drums, music, audio, dialogue? Everything? Well, you know, we haven't even talked about like the the. Um, uh, electronic drums too you know my my, oh, yeah, my youngest sure. grandson uh has a kit of uh i don't know i don't know if it's v drums uh, or not but it's it's an electronic kit and i uh, that's a great idea for the parents because he can whack on those things all day long and they don't hear a thing yep. um but i know i was reading um um uh adrian blue you know who's like he's actually a yes. drummer too in addition to being yeah, a yeah. world-class guitar player and he was talking about playing with um uh, playing with the trio with Robert Fripp and I forgot who the bass player was, but he he was playing the drums. He said it's really easy. I just I do the mix and just send him a <laughs> send him a stereo mix of what I got to the to the front of house, and there you go. Wow, um, wow, yeah. I mean the hit, and there's a whole hit episode that's the history of the of, of electronic drums with uh, Justin Greenawalt, which I'll tell people he's 65 drums on YouTube. So he did a whole episode wow. on that, which is really really cool, but. That is, um, and then there's a Simmons drum episode, but when you were engineering, I mean, you saw Simmons and things come in. Yeah. What did you think of that? Well, I mean, what was your they had, they had those in the MIDI room and we had, we had triggers. You know, I, I you know, I go back to even, uh, the Lindrum, which was, which predates MIDI. MIDI wasn't around until 1983. Sure. The Lindrum was out in 1982 and every studio had a Lindrum and, and, uh, it was only eight bit. Uh, they, I think the session, uh, Lynn was actually a guitar player, believe it or not, Roger Lynn, but, but they think the, um, the drummer was, uh, Art Wood, who was an LA session drummer. And he just, I guess he, he did all the, the hits. Yeah. The, the Lynn drum is it, today. If we heard it, we say, really, you know, it'd be like, be like a Baldwin fun machine. But back then yeah. it was just so much better than anything else. We thought, wow, this sounds pretty good. You know? So Jay, um, looking at your list here, um, a couple things that are, that are big topics, but I mean, I, I, they're, they're awesome and they need to be talked about. Let's talk about microphones with recording drums through history. I know in your list you have dynamic versus yeah. condenser versus ribbon and then cardioid versus omni mic patterns on drums. What's let's talk. Well, about yeah, that. they, um, yeah, typically when you think about it, uh, uh, most, most drums, actually the, the actual drums are probably do well with dynamic mics because they, they, you know, they can capture the power. They're, they're higher inertia microphones uh um most most of the you know like the kick drum mics the good ones are dynamic and uh but you know when you're picking up the cymbals and you know which uh the the uh, the uh idiophone type uh, traps those uh do much better with uh condenser mics because they're they're lower inertia they you know they'll pick up the the transient when you hit the symbol with the stick they 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 you know pick that up a little bit better than than uh sure i mean you could you could get it with a dynamic microphone as well but but generally uh condenser mics do much better for for that whereas the dynamic mics do better on, on the drums so um well that'd be like your snare is a 57 and your overhead is a u87 sure. or something uh, and, and you know what adam used to do at, at the studio too and he would he would use probably both he would put he would put a 57 on the snare and then for the underside to pick up the snares he'd use like a 414 condenser yeah, mic that's that just takes me back because like every every other day it'd be i just do my formula of like it was like 13 mics it was this yeah. and this and this yeah yeah yeah, yeah. And, and as far as as far as omni versus uh uh, cardioid. Typically, most of the microphones we use were omni. Uh, excuse me, were cardioid because uh, cardioid comes from you know the word heart, like cardiology or cardiovascular, uh, meaning it's heart shaped pattern, meaning it picks yeah, up in one a... direction. So you want to aim the aim the mic at what you want to pick up. You want to aim it at the snare drum or aim it at the tom. Uh, but uh, there are 
cases where uh, actually I, I think overhead sometimes the omni sounded better the omni pattern where it's, it's picking up all around you know the room even above the the symbols i know yeah. uh, orchestral recording uh, Omni mics are used almost exclusively. They, they use very few cardioid mics. They uh, like the, yeah. the famous Decca tree that they that's, they've used for you know since the the fifties or so. They, uh, it's like a, a, a triangular tree with the three mics there. Those are all uh, omnidirectional microphones. Um, I would do Omni for like we'd have classical pianists come in, and it would be a it would be like U eighty sevens, and they'd be on Omni, mm -hmm. and it would be you know there's you're not really punching. It would be just a clean take, and then maybe one or two, but those were intense yeah, sessions yeah. of uh, <laughs> very good players. But um, all right. And then into we have all the recording, we have the microphones and then leading into the mixing of it. Yes. How does that work? Well, I always tell my students, you know, it, it kind of depends on the ensemble. But if you have a typical piano, bass, drums, uh, singer type ensemble, uh, there's nothing much in that high range. You know, think of a guitar as kind of almost in the cello range. So it's, it's low for, and, you know, it can get way up on the neck too, but, but, you know, most of the power chords are down low. So you don't have a lot of high stuff except for the cymbals and the drums. So make sure you, you fill those last two octaves, you know, from 5k up to 20k with, with some cymbals. Otherwise it's going to sound like a AM radio type mix. Sometimes I think it comes down to what the, 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 monitors speakers mm -hmm. that you're mixing on and the headphones sure. like where if you can't hear it you think it doesn't matter <laughs> but you think it would you say it adds like a nice brightness to the mix yeah and more uh, clarity uh, here's here's kind of a, a short story you know the theme from shaft was recorded at uh stacks in memphis which is a converted th i i've visited there a few years ago but the engineer who mixed it actually came from ardent which is another studio in memphis and their monitors were were much brighter than the than the ones at stacks and so uh, you know, the uh, theme from Shaft starts out with this almost sibilant hi hat, you know, thing. Yeah, yeah. and and uh, everybody, every, immediately, everybody perked up when they heard that, and and they they credit that for almost making it a hit, you know, because it's like, well, then should I've redone that? Well, you know, it was a hit, so no, you know, yeah, no, <laughs> <laughs> but but yeah, if like I said, the, the drums affects the sound of everything in the mix, and if if you can, you know, don't don't forget those top two octaves because. The, the, the symbols might be the only thing filling that out. If you can hear that, suddenly it sounds really high fi You can you're hearing way way up high now. You know. Yeah, yeah. I think engineering and recording and um, recording drums in general. But but again, be a, like I'm a lifelong drummer. But I found a lot of my. I mean, I still work in Pro Tools every day in some Good. capacity for video. I do a lot of mixing for video and YouTube for other people. But like. For people who are audio engineers, let's say drummers or or whatever, uh, audio engineering, mixing things can be very daunting and it's just like there's a lot. And hearing you talk about it sometimes of the way tape was, it's just a lot. But I will say what I learned from you going back to day one of interning, Bootsy, I think, came <laughs> in and we recorded something with Bootsy for the first day. That's cool. But it was... it you had a way of like simplifying things where, and, and I loved working with Adam as well, but he would have like our ADR sessions with him would be 50 tracks prepared everything. It was templated. It was beautiful. But I remember doing uh, fantastic beasts with you. And I think you had it boiled down to like four tracks. I had, I it might've been six, but you know, he, or six, but, but it was very clean. Yeah. Well, and, I, I, I thought about that, you know, uh, in these ADR sessions, sometimes you'll have like a, a, a dialect coach, you have the director yep. and you, and all these people have to be heard. Then of course you have the production dialogue and the production yes. uh, stuff. And then of course the actor, the boom and the lob. So yeah, it might've been like six or six tracks or so, but yeah, it's sometimes Adam stuff, you know, he was prepared for everything. And, and sometimes when I when I'd do that template, it'd be like, where am I? <laughs> there's just too well, much stuff. But there's, but again, both are right. Yeah, and yeah. his mind works better. And again, we're, He's amazing. Speaking very yeah. he's he's unbelievable. Yeah, he he's is. the most one of the most knowledgeable guys. Absolutely. You, and Absolutely. you and Adam are incredible. But but you you guys would have this, and I learned from you to just simplify things. And I think that applies to people who are, you know, whatever. If you're starting a podcast, if you're recording drums, just like like I don't think I really, as far as my voice on here, I never really add too much EQ. I cut a lot and then I boost I boost when I need, but you 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 kind of learn from audio engineering with drumming and things like you think add, add, add. But <laughs> I learn more about like, take things away, simplify it. Um, and I think I credit a lot of that to you. Yeah. There's uh, a, there's usually some tubbiness uh, around two, you know, somewhere between two and 300 Hertz that if you take a little bit of that out, yeah, suddenly it, it makes it, uh, 
you know, it's, oh yeah, sounds sounds clear, you know. Well, like someone's asked me like uh, in the past, uh, my friend Craig, who does the Practicing Drummer podcast, he was I was explaining to him, it was like, well, how do you EQ things? And I say, I dip out at one k, and I do a, I, 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 I cut at one k, and I cut at two hundred hertz, and then I roll off at like sixty, and it's like that pretty much works at like <laughs> on most voices, and especially mine. But I'm like the really, really, really low stuff on a voice. It's like. Uh, it's not really helping, but anyway, I just, I learned a lot from you and I want to say thank you for, well, uh, you know, teaching me so much. Oh, I, I, I had no idea, but, but thank you too for, yes. you know, for all yes, you've absolutely. done. Absolutely. Anyway, so Jay, you've got a lot of projects and things that you've done in the past. Is there anything you want to plug as we wrap up? No, here? not I mean, really. <laughs> yeah, just the fun of talking. <laughs> yeah, no, this is fun. I, I enjoy this. And, and again, happy birthday. Oh, thank you so much. Like I said, perfect way to do it i'm up here in the attic and i got to take my card table apart and set it and take it back down because they're doing more drywall tomorrow <laughs> but um on that note i want to thank everyone for listening to the podcast watching it on youtube sticking with me on on i'm spreading out every two weeks now we'll be back to every week um i know jay's students are interested in podcasting and the one thing i will say if if any of them listen is after five years scheduling and balancing it with your life becomes quite the uh, balancing act, especially with three small kids. Um, Absolutely. So, yeah. Anyway, Jay, thank you so much for your time. Thank you for being here. It's <laughs> been a pleasure. Thank you, Jay. You bet. Thank you, Bart. <laughs>